Tanishma, welcome to Upstream Livestream. Great to have you here with us in the Super Union offices. Lovely, delighted to be here. Oh, great. And Google is 20 years old this year. So parties and celebrations happening? Um, we a few parties and celebrations. I think it's, there's actually, I think it's that moment of you go, my goodness, it's 20 years mm. old. Uh, which I think when you kind of stop and think about the impact it's had on our lives, I think we've had a lot of fun reflecting back yeah. on the last 20 years, uh, looking back at everything from how the products evolved, but actually how our behaviour and how it's impacted right. people's lives. It's been wonderful talking to consumers, people, businesses, etc., and thinking about their journey with search. So how imagine it's almost impossible to imagine kind of life yeah. without Google yeah, yeah. and how we reach to it for our answers, but also phenomenal to think about how it's helped businesses grow, helps people enable to do things. So we've loved the reflective piece. Yeah. Um, I think with any kind of anniversary of that nature, it also allows you to kind of stop and go, what next? Yeah. You know, wh where do the next 20 years take us to? I talk about Google as an, as an example of a creative business of you know the very, very um, highest kind. I mean, I think of Google as a creative business, but you're a technology business, you're an information business, you're a sort of social utility business in some mm -hmm. way. How do you, how do you describe Google and, and where do you think the kind of relationship is between technology, innovation, the mission, et cetera? Mm. Well, I think, you know, as you say, at its heart technology, and it's interesting, it's great to hear you say that you think of us as that creative business because I think that's actually part of the journey that we've been on so from a technology point of view of course you know being engineers and using technology and data particularly to um, be able to deliver on the mission that they set out to but the reality is you can only really set out on that mission with those skills if you have the ability to dream you know that ability to think creatively mm. Mm. to take huge problems and real challenges and think about them in a way that you would approach them and I think one of the most beautiful things I think in the last 20 years as we see through not just the evolution of our products, but actually the evolution of the business, is that the convergence of the art and science through the organisation. Mm. You know, the acceptance that, you know, I think a lot of the engineers and particularly when you hear the stories of why we created Google Translate mm. or why we created some of the products, actually when you hear these engineers talk about it, it would be as if it was a creative talking about it. It's mm. that same mm. scope of dreaming and imagination mm. and high ambition and the um, central focus of taking magic, but thinking about a user mm. and thinking about how does the user mm. navigate that piece through. And I think that's that's at the heart, the creativity. Mm. I think data and technology alone, without the ability to think of emotion mm. and how things are perceived and how they're delivered and the ability, I think, to be able to consider how you touch and dream and, and consider is they have to go hand in hand. Mm. Mm. Otherwise you become in this very um, functional process which exists. But I really believe actually I think at the heart of, of Google beyond the mission, it's the approach and mm. that moonshot thinking. Mm. That idea that, you know, that I suppose one of the more famous examples is the, um, when Larry first thought about driverless cars, you know, they were flying over LA and were looking at the, you know, horrific traffic that is kind of notorious in, in Los Angeles. And looking at the kind of movement of cars and thinking mm. of that initially very much from a data perspective of actually, you know, if you were to think about it's the same challenge around data and numbers and can you normalise right. this? But then layered into that is the environment, environmental impact. There is the aesthetics, the design, the creativity, the impact on individuals. How does it change and improve mm. lives? Mm. But I think at its heart and its inherence, it's a clear mission and an ability to think differently. Yeah. And I think it's that ability to think differently is what we look for in employees yeah. It's what comes through in every story yeah. when we describe the new products, the new changes, the opportunities. This idea that we have 20% time. Yeah. For me, I is, that 20, is that yeah, true? Is that absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, sometimes it's 120. I'd like to say it was 80 <laughs> 20. It's not quite the same. And that started very much from the engineers. The idea yeah. that these engineers, of course, were working on projects, but they had other ambitions and ideas. And it's like, actually, how, how can you foster that behavior? It's a true part of people's identity, actually, mm -hmm. to be able to go and do these other things. Yeah. Yeah. So to create the time for people to be able to work on other projects, um, purely of their own decision as to what they were, ideally aligned to the mission. But in some respects, we allowed people to have that creative outlet, that, that opportunity to go and explore other skills, other ideas, other problems that they yeah. considered, yeah. is really where, you know, things like Gmail, uh, Cardboard, you know, what then yeah. kind of evolved into kind of the VR position. A lot of the products we have started from yeah. teams of engineers who'd gathered together outside of the day job 
to think about other yeah. ways of tackling problems. Yeah. It's a big cultural thing, right? You're describing I mean, yeah. you, there's a culture that's built, it's influenced by the founders. I mean, it must get harder and harder to, or does it get harder and harder to keep that embedded in the organisation? Or, or is it just as the organisation expands, is it expanding with it? Yeah, what I do you think do the, the to keep it alive? There's no doubt the culture is actually at the heart of, it, you know, as I say, the mission and the culture is really at the heart of the success of Google. And I think the culture is something that has had to evolve. So it's inherent in the people that they've employed. It's definitely kind of very much bedded into kind of the mission and the values that we mm. have. But I do think that what you create is the environment and that that allows creativity and problem solving mm. and that experimentation, taking risks, creating that culture and that behavior is really at the heart, I think, of any business that can innovate well. Mm. So having a clear focus on, on a broad enough kind of ambition, but giving people the freedom to explore within that. Mm. And it does become hard, I think, you know, as you grow as a workforce, as you have other challenges within there, you absolutely have to consider how do you manage your culture. Mm. And that, I think, is more reflective of human nature in society mm. rather mm. than the kind of um, strengths or weaknesses of any business. Mm. But it yeah. does come down to great leadership. Mm. Um, it comes down to, actually, I think the thing that dawned on me when I joined uh, Google was it, very quickly in a few weeks in was the level of transparency. Mm -hmm. So the trust and transparency that exists in the organisation. So from very early on, the fact that Larry and Sergey would still host these like TGIF meetings mm. in Mountview that were then aired around, around the world, they would share a lot of information. You were given lots of privileged access and trusted. And, and that through to the work that you did and the way that teams were you know, structured and you operated and the way that you performed was very much built around trust and trust mm. was given rather than earned. Mm. Mm. And I think that immediately makes people kind of sit up and go, mm. well, if this is given to me, how do I respond and what do mm. I do? Mm. So I think it is, yeah, it's, it's leadership, it's behaviours, but, but mm. culture, I think in mm. any organisation, mm. is, is incredibly important. Yeah. And yeah. How, do, how do you achieve that? How, do you, what, how would you describe the culture here? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's a passion for creativity and for ideas and for expression and for making things different. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in culture being something that has to be intrinsic. You know, people have to, you can't tell people what culture is. You have oh. to tap into something that, 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 that they want to be part of, they can elect to be part of, but then they themselves can be part of it. So, you know, less, less rule book and more, more kind of permission almost to be yourself in some ways. Mm. I mean, that, I, I think that's important. And, and you know, I, it, it's hard to engender though, right? Mm. I mean, and it doesn't work with everybody. And I mean, I think it's an one of the interesting questions we often wrestle with and as we talk to clients is, can anybody be creative? I mean, can you create a creative culture in which anybody can, can, can operate? And, you know, I mean, to some extent, I think you can. I mean, interested in your point of view on that. I think the, the definition of creativity is so broad and vast. So I, I do believe that actually everyone has some aspect of creativity. It's just how it's defined and how it's manifested. But, you know, we, we look at our data scientists through to those who work very much, you know, in a 100% creative role. And there is there are flavours of creativity across all of that. You know, our data guys have to have the, the ability to visualise right. and think about right. and see the patterns and shapes through the data they do, the way that they structure. If you look at code, actually code is a very beautiful and creative mm -hmm. thing when you actually mm. look at it and consider it mm. so I think I think absolutely I think everyone is, has it and I think that's part of the challenge around the way businesses or even education approach creativity is a sense that it's those that are and those mm. that aren't whereas actually mm. I believe everyone has some form mm. of expression and ability to think creatively mm. Mm. you know we think one of the kind of core um, ways that we assess talent but also how we nurture talent is that ability to problem solve and part mm. of problem solving um, which can be approached many different ways is there is a creative way mm. of considering that mm. um, it there is through leadership looking at how creativity is demonstrated and mm. delivered as well as kind of in the more natural pure sense of creativity mm. as well mm. in how do we add our creative teams we have a creative lab brilliant team throughout the organization in, in Europe run by Steve Ranikis, um, who's in, from ex-creative agencies. But I look at the work that they do and they are an incredible blend of people in those teams who are on the one hand, I would say, you would look at and say pure creatives. On the other hand, you would easily be able to mm. define some of those to say, actually mm. I wouldn't have put them in mm. a creative bucket. Mm. But yet it's the mix and the uh, collaboration of those individuals, right. which is what creates this beautiful right. work. Right, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it? The pigeonholing thing, I mean, I. I joined the agency world sort of halfway through my career, having been in 
organizations on, on what we would call the client side, but companies like Levi Strauss and Converse, and, um, and I joined the agency world, and I couldn't believe that were, well, you could be a creative, or you could be a strategist, or you could be a, a suit, or, or a planner, and I, I couldn't quite understand where those distinctions came from, because, right. I mean, to me, creativity is that thing of adding something to the world that wasn't there before, right, or rethinking something that didn't exist. Mm. So I'd be fully with you, you know, a data scientist can be as creative as, 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 as anybody else, or more creative. I mean, and coders are, mm. are almost by definition, right, creating things that didn't Absolutely. exist before. But there's a couple of points you made uh, just then, which I thought were really interesting. Uh, one around putting different people together, and, and that idea that, you know, by, by getting different points of view together and, um, uh, you know, forcing different opinions almost to sort of um, combine and, and um, relate to each other, you get interesting results. I mean, that is a, both a functional thing, but, but also I, I imagine in the world there's a, there's a lot to be said for diversity of different backgrounds, different types of people, um, different perspectives, et cetera. I mean, that's something I think you believe in personally quite a lot as well. Yeah, isn't it? absolutely. I think, I think at the heart of any business, you know, the, the being reflective of the, your customers or the products that you're delivering, you have to consider how do you understand and represent that. And for, for Google, where we are creating, our, you know, the essence of our products is about creating something for everyone. And if you're going to make things for everyone, create products and opportunities for everyone, you have to be able to understand that. And diversity isn't always the obvious things that we kind of consider in this day and age, whether it's kind mm. of gender or race. Actually, you know, we had to think about things around our engineering teams where we had teams who had, um, I think that we had a team that everyone was right-handed. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't mm -hmm. considered actually how using some of our products, if you were left-handed, and how the functionality and the thought about some of the kind of uh, user experience would need to be. And so you start to think about actually how do you ensure you have teams that do reflect our society, our people, uh, the humanity and consumers in the way that allow us to design the very best things. So on the one hand, it's about creating the best things that be able to be representative and understood. Mm. The other is it's the sparks that you can create between right. different voices and thought, because I think, again, you can, um, which is why I talk a lot about inclusivity rather than diversity. I think diversity mm. can lead you very much down to a um, the route of tick boxing mm. without really genuinely achieving mm. the magic that you get when you, you don't have necessarily truly. get the benefit, right? Because right. yeah. yeah. you can build yeah. a diverse team but not have a diversity of thought. Mm. You can create in, and believe you're achieving diversity but not truly look at inclusivity. Mm. Mm. And I think also there are so you know the definitions or the boxes that exist around diversity that aren't necessarily very helpful. So we look at it much more in the sense of inclusivity. Um, you know, there is always going to be some degree of tip boxing as you start to kind of move in that direction. But as you start to accelerate mm. and move into teams that are more reflective of the world that we live in, actually, the more we have the opportunity to challenge ideas, mm. reflect different opinions and views, be genuinely thoughtful about mm. what we're creating. Mm. You know, I think, I think we still have uh, considerable challenges around lots of aspects of diversity. But actually, I was talking to someone very recently wonderful lady called Sinead Burke, who um, is prolific in the fashion industry. She was actually a teacher. Um, she is 3.5 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So uh, she has a particular condition that is a form of dwarfism. And she talks about um, being a teacher and being able to address a room of students when you're that height and about the mm. levelling of things like that. And so she, she's done lots of wonderful work about um, challenging thought and uh, process and products in the fashion industry and we had her come and talk to us recently and I spoke to her for a while afterwards and it was brilliant to talk to her about our products mm. and I said so you know how do you feel about our products how well do they serve you what could we do better and she said oh they're great you know and I know we have lots of initiatives at Google where we think about access and accessibility but she gave me 10-15 ideas Mm. in the space mm. of probably about 20 minutes of a mm. conversation where she said, well, wouldn't it be great actually if you could change maps to do this or mm. you could do that? And without having representation, without having the opportunity to talk mm. to individuals across every aspect of life, we miss that. You'd miss that, yeah. Despite having, yeah. you know, great teams of very, very mm. smart engineers and, and researchers, it mm. really demonstrates that need mm. for true diversity in you our You need dreams. that input, but you've also yeah. got to be open-minded, right, as an organisation and as people to listen to that. Mm. Because, I mean, a lot of people who giving you an opinion, a lot of people who Absolutely. then won't listen to it as well yeah. as another thing, which is... And unconscious bias has been, a, is a challenge for us as it is for anyone else, because you say you can go so far, but if you 
you need to change the wiring as well and, and the way that we approach and how do you listen, most mm. importantly, and actually how do you mm. absorb and use that and welcome mm. different mm. inputs because mm. actually mm. it's one thing to be in the room, it's another thing to be in a room and feel that you can contribute right. and participate right. and, and add. Right. Do you think there's an issue with creative thinkers and, 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 and people in creative roles that they often lack the confidence to go and do what she was doing, which is to express those points of view, to, to, you know, to be forceful, to stand up for them. I mean, I've talked to times about you know, creative people suffer from a form of Stockholm syndrome where they, they sit as sort of prisoners in an organization, but they mistake a, a lack of abuse for an act of kindness, a sort of psychological <laughs> de definition of Stockholm syndrome. And, and, and so they sit quietly and sort of get on with the stuff and do stuff if they're asked. But, do you think there's a need for people to stand up more and be more assertive in asking for the things that mm. they want and driving change and, and, and driving creativity in the world? Yeah, I think, I think creativity particularly, depending on where you sit in terms of confidence, is it's an incredibly vulnerable and subjective mm. Mm. work and output and position to be in. So if you're not of the mind to be able to be confident and support and defend your work, or present it in a way that you feel comfortable about doing so and feel that it can be welcomed. The reality is you probably will retreat or mm. you're less likely to stand up or you're less likely to present, push forward. Mm. Um, there are many reasons why the numbers of women, particularly in executive creative director roles in agencies particularly, and a lot of that is around actually culture and behaviours mm. and how do we encourage more people to step forward and do so. So I agree mm. with you. I think there is a, mm. a case that it's very easy to retreat and actually how do you bring ideas that, are less than perfect. How mm, do you right. invite? It's one of the things I think we've looked at a lot within Google is actually how do you how do we encourage teams to bring things forward when they're not fully formed? Right. I think there's a security, a particularly in a creative sense, of being able to go away and fully form something and fully complete it and then present it versus actually what we know is that mm. kind of messy collaboration mm. of bringing the kind of early shoots of an mm. idea and then mm. bringing it and inviting and having confidence mm. for people to come in and mm. challenge and Where often and they get feedback. better, right? Because yeah. little, little shoots kind of... Of course, and then everyone builds on them and they make yeah, them better. And yeah, we love yeah. saying, and we, and we laugh a lot about the fact that we have this endless saying about, you know, feedback is a gift. <laughs> and, and most of the time it is a gift. Occasionally we do laugh about the fact that you'd like to return the gift. But, um, <laughs> you know, nine times out of ten... It is having the openness. You know, we talk about, from a leadership point of view, psychological safety is one of the most important things that we, we, we want to ensure we have in our teams because we have psychological... Thing. I love that. Yeah, because I do. If you have psychological safety, you're inviting people to be able to contribute, yeah. to take risks, yeah. to, to experience yeah. failure, to yeah. look at how you support, to yeah. be open, to give, to open to receive feedback as well as to give right. it. Yeah, yeah. And once you create psychological safety amongst teams, actually that's where we can see through the work that we've done, say through the research of our teams, our most highest performing teams are the ones where they experience psychological safety. Mm. So mm. focusing on that attribute as a leader mm. is, is critical. Mm. When I look at it from a creative mm. point of view, even more so, mm. because that process requires mm. many hands mm. to really come back to. That's a really that's lovely point. I love that. I've never heard that term before, psychological safety. And I imagine that's a very different kind of leader behavior, right, and almost a different kind of leader profile to that which a lot of organizations are used to, to be able to acknowledge, I mean, high emotional intelligence has to be part of that, I imagine, and permission and, you know, allow people to take risks, allow occasional failure. It's a really interesting mm. idea. It, so it brings me to another of the points that you made a little earlier about education and the role of education. And I mean, we gnash our teeth a lot here about the, the, the lack of creative education in a, in a proper mm. sense. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are issues in you know, technology and other areas as well. But I mean, what, what needs to happen in education mm. for us to be able to, 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 to get more people of the nature that we um, believe are the right ones to, to drive? I, I think we forward? have a huge challenge with uh, creative education in this country, particularly, you know, obviously the changes that were made to the uh, curriculum where creativity has been you know, and arts has pretty much mm. been removed from mm. most schools in favour of STEM education. And of mm. course, we recognise the importance and, and desperate need to encourage more children to consider STEM education, particularly things like computer science and, and mm. engineering. But at the same time, we also, we, you know, we never said it in favour of, of removing arts. And actually, you know, we, I work particularly with a wonderful guy called Nick Corston from um, an association called STEAM.org. And this idea of STEAM, you know, so it's science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. Because mm. actually, you know, if we look forward, you know, and, and this is, I think it's always slightly controversial that Google say something like this, but, 
you know, some of our engineers and, and actually one of our head of our, our venture capitalist funding um, team had said, the reality is, is actually machine learning and the way that we look at the development of coding is our obsession around kind of kids need to code. Yeah, they need to understand it. They need to mm. understand the principles of problem solving and the approach and the um, logic that's required. But there is a chance in a reality that the machines will code for us. Mm. And actually the thing that we cannot do and the thing that we need to be able to kind of encourage and develop in our children more than important than anything else as we look to the future is creativity. Mm. It's the ability to express and to mm. dream and to consider and to look at that intersection of art and science. Mm. And the lack of that creativity, not mm. just from a concern around his skills mm. and expression in that, but also about things like mental health mm. and our ability to communicate. Mm. So I, I do, I worry greatly about the lack of creative education. We do a lot around trying to support organisations that are encouraging children to consider creativity, but also working with st schools and institutions to think about technology and art and the intersection of the two. Mm. You know, I, I, mm. I was, um, my kids are almost at an age where we're looking at, we're about a year away from looking at secondary schools. So right. I've been out visiting lots of schools mm. and I have uh, boy girl twins. So mm -hmm. I have the kind of joy looking mm -hmm. at both of them. Right. And it's fascinating at listening to how teachers and, and uh, education authorities, etc., talk about future education and education responsibilities between mm. girls and boys, particularly mm. and, and how some are more adept to the others. And I don't, I definitely don't sign up to that either. And it worries me because actually I look at it and think, we're not future-proofing them right? because it's hard to determine. I, I certainly couldn't, yeah. nor would we ever choose to predict what the future would be. But what we can do and what we look in our staff and we look at our teams and we look at what we want to try and build forward are the skills that are required, you know, that incredible critical thinking, mm. creativity, mm. problem solving, mm. um, empathy, yeah, kindness, human understanding, human understanding yeah, that emotional yeah, intelligence, yeah, yeah. those yeah. being able to take big problems and solve yeah. them beyond yeah. the obvious parts of kind of engineering are crucial. Yeah. So um, we encourage businesses, I work with lots of creative agencies. I think there's so much more we can do. Yeah both to encourage um, education and parents and kids around thinking about art. I think there's a lot to be said about defining creativity. I think yeah. as an industry, yeah. particularly the advertising industry, there is so much more we could do to actually yeah. market ourselves yeah. better. No, it's terrible. I mean, as an industry, we're terrible. I mean, we can't describe like half the terms we use all the time. No. Like creativity, brand, no one knows what a brand is in no. you know, definition terms, or at least no one agrees on what it is. And it, it is true. But there is, I mean, there's something really fundamental isn't there in all this about understanding people what people need what is valuable to people what's valuable to society and and you know being able to sort of judge you know i mean that that element of judgment is hugely important mm. isn't it in in all of this all the technical skills that mm. people that can, can, can have I and mean, it goes back to your mission i suppose that if you, yeah. if you understand what's valuable to people in the world then 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 it helps you and that judgment is such a as you say there's a great way to think of it is the it's a it's a difficult skill to teach someone, but it's all the mm. resources that you can inspire mm. them with that will mm. help them lead to great judgment. Mm. You know, I think of um, we have an, another project which is our arts and culture project where we uh, set out on a mission, which was again led by one of our engineers, an engineer from India who'd come over to um, who's working in one of our offices in Europe and had visited one of the galleries. Actually, he was in Florence and he went into one of the galleries and was just blown away by the beauty of the art that he mm. saw. And he said, how do I find a way to make sure that everyone can see this art? Because actually all my friends and kids that I grew up with in India had never seen this. Mm. And he set about on a mission to say, is there a way that we could photograph all this beautiful art mm. and push it out through the web in the way that mm. we do? And from such humble beginnings, the arts and culture kind of project and, and app and function that people can anywhere in the world can access has been absolutely incredible mm. about bringing art to everyone mm. and trying to again mm. remove some of the elitism and some of the mm. pressure and the pain that perhaps sits around the art world and making it available mm. to, to everyone and what does that then do in terms of inspiring future creativity mm. thinking mm. about judgment thinking mm. about you know mm. ways mm. that people can approach i mean there's an element isn't there of leading the horse to water in in some of those things isn't there because i mean it reminds me actually that's a very interesting 
Um, example, we did a project about 10 years ago with the National Gallery in London where the brief was to get more young people coming to the gallery. And we said, we can't get young people to come to the gallery. What we can do is take the gallery to young people. So we took life-size replicas of 44 paintings that hung in the National Gallery and put them on the streets all around London. And yeah. it was amazing. I mean, we got an amazing reaction to it from people who otherwise would have said, I'm not interested mm. in old master paintings. But there's something about giving people exposure, isn't there, to things that are beautiful, wonderful, creative, interesting, intellectually stimulating, that can help change. I mean, there's got to be a little bit of, of push, hasn't there, Absolutely. from us to, to try and help. Look at the work that someone like the Royal Opera House have done, mm. um, who have worked very closely with us at YouTube, and have considered actually how can technology enable them to reach more, not because they believe or feared that that would displace the idea that people would want to experience live music mm. or performance, mm. but actually by teasing mm. them and demonstrating mm. and showing them actually invited more of them in. Mm. And mm. I think that's where sometimes we have to consider how, what's the role that technology can play and can mm. enable mm. versus fearing it. Mm. Nishma, thank you so much for coming to Upstream Livestream. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Likewise.